Hi folks and welcome back to Planescape Dormant. We are here in Sigil in the uh oh I forgot what it's called, the brothel of um intellectual lusts something like that. Talking to a very interesting woman. Well, the second very interesting woman we found uh here, the first being uh, the most beautiful woman on uh, any plane of existence, that we could not convince joining the party yet, and Eve the tail chaser. Let's see uh, what the... Uh... Yes, we have come to trade more tales. What other tales uh, she has to tell? Let's tell her of Requin's curse, <laughs> sure. Eve leans forward as you tell the tale of Requin's odiferous curse. She seems to devour your every word. As you finish, she smiles at you. I shall remember this tale, and now I have one for you, the Gilded Tale. Okay. Upon the plain of Isgard is the Gilded Hall, where those sensates that seek the pleasure of gullet and loin can be found. They indulge these passions in earnest, never realizing that the doors of the hall never open, and that there is no clear path back to the Civic Fest Hall. They are the unwanted sensates, the ones that do not truly believe in the faction, but instead seek only pleasure for pleasure's sake, and are prisoners who do not realize they are such truly prisoners. Mm-hmm. Well, aren't we all prisoners of uh, either remaining alive or dead in that sense? They are only doing what is in their nature. I have another tale to share with you. Let's tell her about the Silent King, but first the Alley of Lingering Sighs. As you finish, she smiles at you. I shall remember this tale. And now I have one for you. Before I begin, I must ask, do you know what a Modron is? Nope. Modrons are creatures of total law. Almost more machinery than living things. Oh yeah. Uh, right. There are many different sorts of Modron, but all have their place in very rigid, carefully organized hierarchy. So dedicated are they to this system that they cannot communicate with or even consider the existence of Modrons who are not their immediate superiors or inferiors. Well, if it's a hierarchy, there are surely equivalent positions at some point, or is everyone... Hmm... If so, it's not really a hierarchy, but, uh, well, it is a hierarchy, but a single echelon hierarchy. Not sure how that would work. So, not multi-level, but a level per individual, necessarily? Isn't that... Hmm, how would that function as a hierarchy instead of a a cooperative. Well, everyone might not have an equal say, but everyone will have their specific position and not a rigid hierarchy necessarily. That's a bit self contradicting in more than one way, but uh, we'll further explore that uh, if we can with a discussion about Modrons. I understand. Then I shall tell you the tale of the clock and the quadrone. Sure. Once upon a time, there existed a Modron. It was newly created, its logic fresh and untested, and it had come to Sigil following the commands of its Modron superiors. Really, only one superior, because if there were more superiors, they would, uh, well, be superior to the superior just underneath them, if you get my drift, because every single one would have either a superior or an inferior, and no equal, so they would each have an inferior that is superior to this Modron. Yeah, again, how does this hierarchy function? But go on. I knew of nothing but commands and dictates of obedience and passing along the orders of its superiors, for you see, Modrons are only aware of the commands of their immediate superiors. They have no grasp of higher authority until this one. Right, so, again, you're self-contradicting the organization you're putting forward. If each Modron only knows a superior and an inferior immediate uh, in 
the hierarchy, it means that each and every modron has no equal. And so there is always going to be higher authority to their immediate superior. Are they incapable of logic? Because the system you're hmm, describing has one absolute ruler that is superior to every single other Modron and has no superiors of their own. Hmm. Still go on. One day it came upon a small shop within which there was a small clock that could no longer tell time. It was cracked along the edges, the wheels of its hands broken. The Modron immediately set itself to work at getting the parts to fix the broken clock. It made a new wooden housing for the clock's parts, replaced the bent springs, carefully filed and oiled the clockwork machinery, and carved new hands from the sparse metal available to it. The newly repaired clock's precise sticking reminded it of the great gears of Mechanus, and it comforted it as much as anything may comfort a Modron. And what the Modron never came to understand was that it truly loved this clock that it had worked on, and for reasons it could not explain, elected to remain in sigil and be with the clock for the rest of its years. Fell in love with the clock. Hmm. I once fell in love with a... Pastry. It was a short-lived affair. I have another tale to share with you. Tell the story of the Silent King. Eve leans forward. As you tell the tale of a hidden nation of undead, ruled by a corpse who hasn't spoken in a thousand years. He smiles at you. I shall remember this tale. And I have one for you. The Petitioner at the Gate. Go on. It was after... Peak. Far after Peak. What is peak? It was far after peak when the distant pounding was heard at the gates of the prison. Karras, the oldest mercy killer known to the faction. We know Karras. Dragged himself from his post, don't we? I think we, we've met a Karras. Making his way down the hall to the great gates that separated the punished from the outside world. The pounding did not fade as he reached the gate and spoke to it. He called out and received no answer. He opened the gate, far from feeling caution, but a strange, compelling sensation. Was he a hardened intellectual? Go on. A haggard figure was on bent knees just beyond the door. Her hands were bloody from where they had been pounding against the gate, and her breath came in labored gasps. As the flickering light from the interior prison chamber poured across the cobbles, she glanced up at the Mercy Killer, who stood framed in the doorway, and began to sob, huh, sob with relief. Was she expecting a Mercy Killer? He felt himself mirrored in all but his gender as he stared at the woman, but he was, and he was stirred by her presence. Karis found himself unsure of what to say, so he simply waited. Hmm, simply waited for the woman to prov really, provide an explanation? Of what? She did! It was a simple... Hmm... Yeah, I'm reading ahead and... I'm not sure where this is going. She did! It was a simple statement, but of utmost importance, and it made Karras, whose knees ached painfully with every movement, bend down, because he took an arrow to the knee and couldn't adventure anymore, probably, bend down and help the woman to her feet. He brought her in from the outside, guiding her gently into the passage beyond. She had said that an injustice had been done, and that was all that Karis needed to hear. In the end, it came to pass that she could not fulfill her duty as a fury, for a man guilty of a blood crime had died unpunished. She begged Karis and the Mercy Killers for aid, so they executed her. She had failed in her charge. Yeah. Is this the woman we met? No. The one to die? Probably not. Let's see, another tale. Uh, let's tell her the story of our waking up. Is 
She'll tell us of the Dustman Chapters of Dust. Oh, a related story. There are chapters in the Dead Book, the massive tomb which Dustman keeps, that records the passing of all that lives into the eternal boundary. In this book, there are chapters that are naught but dust. And it is believed that the names therein are lost souls who cannot die. But most suffer life eternally until history itself dies and grants them release. That's... Damn it. Are we in the dust chapters? Do we have any more tales? No. Let's ask questions. Ah, uh, yes. Tell me one of the stories, uh, the one we didn't, uh, the parched land. Uh, no, that wasn't it. Which one uh, was it? The Gilded Tale? Ah, did we lose a story somehow? Hmm. Well, what do you do here? Trade tales, All right. And that's why you're called Tail Chaser, I guess. Once upon a time, a girl came to an oracle who was rumored to know many things and asked for of it a boon. Her life was in need of direction. So she asked of this oracle as to what would give her purpose. Now, the oracle was not evil, but it was vague and tended towards drink which caused it to be obscure in many matters of judgment and focus. Yeah. Don't drink and oracle. I guess. Its only answer to the girl's question was that within one story that she would hear in her lifetime was the truth that she sought. Oh, come on. That's really vague. The girl went off and collected stories which she chases to this day, not knowing which of the thousands hold the truth. Such is the danger of a foolish question and the wisdom of an unspoken one. Yeah, more like uh, an incredibly uh, dense interpretation of a really innocuous response. Man, what is it with people in this uh, establishment and low intelligence? I have another question. Uh, then again, I might not have another question. Do you know anything about Ravel Puzzlewell? The tale of Ravel Puzzlewell, a frightener of children, begins and ends with the question, what can change the nature of man? Many were the times she posed this riddle to those who approached her, those who sought to glean from her the strange magics that she alone seems to possess. All attempted to answer her query, but to no avail. And they found the price of their wrong answer to be some horrible fate, always more terrible than the lost victims. To recount their various traumas would be to speak of things that nightmares are woven from, right? The tale strikes me in this way. Ravel herself knew not the answer to this question, but she lusted for such an answer. Only the why of the matter remained in question. Why did the nature of a man matter to one of the Grey Sisters, especially to one of such power as Ravel? It is said that she put the question to the Lady of Pain, not directly, but shouted it to Sigil itself, daring for the Lady to answer. When no reply was forthcoming, she wove terrible magics that threatened to open the cage and let the fury of the plains roll in like a wave. That would be dramatic. She received no answer other than banishment. To this day, no one knows the answer to Ravel's question. Hmm. And now there is no one to petition, for Ravel herself is gone, lost, to the plains. Updated my journal. Wait, there is more. Though my tale ends with Ravel's demise, there are some that claim the hag still lives. There is a silent prostitute here who once talked of such things, but she speaks no longer. If she would speak to you, she might tell you more of Ravel. What can you tell me of this silent prostitute? Updated my journal. Echo. 
Eve frowns, thinking, I once heard a tale of a girl who knew the word that, if spoken, would undo the multiverse. Perhaps this is Echo. That's uh, quite the responsibility. Ask Dolora, though. I understand that she sometimes meets with one who knew Echo before she stopped speaking. Dolora. Farewell. So we need to find Dolora and then the silent prostitute. And don't come back, you pitiful excuse. <laughs> His maxi at her tongue. The wild-looking tiefling girl meets your gaze with an angry scowl. Her tattooed body is practically naked. Covered by only a narrow leather thong, a black cloth brassiere, and armored shoulder pads that appear to serve more as decoration rather than actual protection. Her spiked hair, as well as the thin fur that covers her goat-like legs, is brassy white. And numerous silver rings dangle from her ears, nostrils, lips, and brow. She wears a leather collar around her throat with the inscription Kimaskisi Adertan. Kimaskisi Adertan. Kismaxi bares her teeth at you. What? And just what are you looking at, you banged up sod? Me? Moi, banged up sod? Look at you. My friend thought you were attractive, but whoa, was he ever horribly mistaken. <laughs> Nice, nice. Nice intro to, uh, to the situation, Morte. She sneers at Morte, then looks below him where a body would normally be. Sharp tongue for a stemless debtor. Does he have a tongue? I don't think so. That's enough, you two kids. Sure, Chief, whatever. What a witch, huh? Then waggles his eyebrows. I like that. Does he have eyebrows? I haven't seen any. I'm sure you do, Morty, but I need to talk to her. The tiefling rolls her eyes. And what makes you think I care? Why don't you lick my backside? My tongue's not wide enough and I don't like hair in my mouth. <laughs> what? <laughs> That's the only option? Well, you seem to like the taste of awful in your mouth. Your mouth, your dung breath. <laughs> yeah, we do like the taste of awful in our mouth because what else is there to eat in the... Multiverse. Only because it's like kissing you, you mangy stinkpot. <laughs> okay, so we are playing... We are playing... Monkey Island now, right? Kiss me? She makes a retching sound. I'd rather kiss a bloody mess of phlegm that lay my lips on you. No thanks. Don't thank me. Thank the power of someone actually wants to kiss you. His Maxi looks at the loss for something to say. For an instant, a smile threatens to crack the grimacing mask of her face. Then she becomes more of a basilisk than ever. <laughs> Alright, what do you want from me? Questions answered. He looks annoyed. Fine, whatever, ask. Who are you? My name? Uninterested, I can guess yours, though. Scar bunch, get out of here before I put a fire under your arse. Right. Subtle, subtle, subtle. Can you tell me about the silent prostitute? That echo chit? Don't know anything about her. Don't talk to the girl. I mean, why? Not like she can talk back. Ask Frigid Dolora about her. I think I saw her playing. Go with an old crush of echoes. Back from where she could talk. From when was she could talk? Okay. Have another question. Say, can you teach Morty to be more abusive? <laughs> sure, let's say that. <laughs> now that's an unusual request. I don't know, it seems pretty foul mouth already. <laughs> yes, but we want to push the envelope. We want to see where the limit lies. He, that's... He seems pretty foul mouth. Kismaxi bladder dung, your scruffy good gammed harlot. It's scruffy nerf herder, not goat gammed. Ah. You wish you had legs like mine, you pitiful wretch of a bone mox. I can walk, run, dance, what can you do? Bob around wishing you had a pair. Goats or otherwise. <laughs> the two of them lay into one another, exchanging barbed, blistering insults and clashing with razor-edged tongues. Okay, let's just 
lay back and watch. At last, the two stop their bickering, and eerie silence settles over them as they eye one another hatefully. Finally, the tiefling makes a grudging admission to the Morte. You're not bad, really. Not bad at all. Better than you, perhaps? Eh? Eh? Kiss Moxie narrows her eyes on Morte. Don't push it, Skull. New taunts, all right. I won't, tiefling. I will admit I might have learned a thing or two, though. Good thinking, chief. So, was that all you wanted? I'm not spending any more time near you than I have to. That's it for now. Farewell. So, he learned stuff? Really? What's up? I don't know. Apparently you learned new taunts, but I don't know what sort of I'm taunts gone. that would be. Okay, nobody in here, so... Hmm, a handkerchief. What does that do? An unremarkable silk handkerchief. Okay. Kisiceris. Red-haired. This description... This alarmingly voluptuous woman has a thick mane of wavy raven-colored hair. Bluish skin and a shimmering... And shimmering crimson eyes like rubies which have fires lit behind them. Wowza! Though she is not beautiful in the typical sense of the word, her features are exotic and not altogether unattractive. You had me at alarmingly voluptuous. <laughs> no need for anything beyond that. Greetings! The woman's voice is deep and sensuous. And my greetings to you, sir. Her burning eyes roam over you. Ho ho ho! Come on! I'm Kessai Ceres. So tell me, what might I do for you? Hmm? Anything, Morty cries. Do anything you want to me. <laughs> She's only saying what we're all thinking. Guess I laughs heartily, revealing canines long enough to be considered fangs. Eww. Well, maybe not just anything. She shakes her head and smiles at Morty. Truly, though, please, what can I do for you? Well, what do you usually do for patrons? Talk, of course, usually about dreams, often those erotic in nature, but not always. Guess I winked at you, smiling. So, would you like to... Tell me yours? Don't be shy, I've heard everything you know. Nothing will shock or surprise me, and I so love to hear people's dreams. We can try it if you'd like to, but you must go first. Well, my dreams were recently revised when I saw you, my lady. <laughs> Smooth. Where are they now? Guess I smiled, her gleaming red eyes looking you over once more. You look very savage, you know. Tell me, are you rough with your lovers? In the act, I mean? Very physical? That's forward. Do you mean abusive? The many heavens forbid, no! Guess I gives an exasperated sigh. Some people have a very slow and centrous way of doing things. While others are more forward about it, all rough and tumble and rolling about it. You know, I merely wondered where you fell in, is all. <coughs> where we fell? Fell in? Yes. I suppose I'm a bit rough then? Really depends on the mood. She smiles. I thought you'd say as much. I'm quite rough myself. I like to be carried around, and I particularly enjoy biting. Right, like a saber-toothed tiger. That were not tigers. I have sharp teeth, though, so I have to take care. Sometimes I get carried away and draw a little blood, you know. Like, what, five or ten liters? It's enough to make me weep. There was this chit when I had a body. Where was this shit when I was at a body? Well, he probably ate you, and you don't remember. 
Roaming the Outlands, most likely, but that was a rhetorical question, wasn't it? She winks at Morte, then turns to you again. I don't mind... a little bit of biting. She laughs. I doubt I'd get through that thick hide of yours. Anyway, do you have much sensation left in your skin? Not really. The scars are very thick. That's a shame. You do have a lot of scars. Kasai looks closely at your face, even your lips, the lids of your eyes. Tell me, are you scarred everywhere? You know, everywhere. Well, parts of me have somehow managed to stay out of harm's way. That's good then, she laughs cheerfully, then puts on a mock serious look, placing her hands under her hips. You never did tell me about your dreams, you know. Come on, let's have them. I don't have dreams. That's true. She arches her eyebrows. Truly, how sad. Even fiends and divas dream, you know. Are you certain you don't? Quite certain. Too peculiar. I'm at a loss as to what to say. Hmm. Well, don't say anything then. Do you know anything about Ravel Puzzle? Well, nothing. And what are you exactly? She shakes her head. Can't you tell? She draws herself up, thrusting her ample bosom towards you. <laughs> subtle! This is a subtle, subtle character. A woman! She raises an eyebrow. I can see my answer doesn't please you. So many people raising eyebrows in this uh, style of writing. I am plain touched, actually, like your friend here. That's all you need to know. Yes, so you're touching a lot of <coughs> planes, yes. Farewell, then. I bet she touches a lot more than planes. Marissa. Squinting at the figure behind the partition, you can barely make out a shapely female form in the darkness. She turns to you, but you can see nothing of her face. Greetings. The figure answers in a voice that is slow and deadly, like a steel dagger drawn across stone. Huh. That sounds very grating. Yes, come to speak with Marissa, have you? Quite rude of you to enter a darkened room, storming behind my partition like so, rude and foolhardy. You can hear a faint whispering sound like a slight breeze or the hissing of serpents. Is she a Medusa? Maybe Medusa. Creepy shit. My apologies. I wasn't sure if someone was here. It would seem there is someone in this room, wouldn't it? Shall you be on your way, then? Can you answer some questions, maybe? Ask. Right. Why is it so dark in here? To prevent any unwanted and embarrassing casualties. Now, what is it that you want? Questions. Why do you remain behind the screen? Is it your wish that I step away from this partition into some patch of light and speak to you face to face? Marissa laughs, and there is the sound of scales sliding on scales. Nay, I think not. The darkness suits me, and doubtless suits you as well. Hmm. Would she turn us to stone, I wonder? We do have... What is it? Uh... Gorgon Salve. It would turn us back to flesh if she turns us to stone. Hmm. Let's not risk that. Right now, at least. I'm gone. Hmm. There's a secret door there. Ah, there's where Dolores should be. 
And there's something down there, but let's not be too foolhardy. Can you not open the door? Oh. Nobody in there. Oh, lots of Modrons here. We do have one. Yes, a cube. Well, it's a Modron replica. Echo. Oh, but we should talk... Before we talk to Echo, we should talk to Laura first. Nanny Nine Eyes. This petite, attractive young woman is smiling blissfully and humming to herself. Her wide, pale blue eyes seem to constantly drink in her surroundings as she looks about. She sounds... like a cocaine fiend. Greetings! The smiling young woman curtsy, ah, curtsies gracefully and looks up to you smiling. Well met, good sir. I am Nanny. How are you this fine day? Her suddenly notices your scars and places a gloved hand over her mouth. Oh my, you're hurt. She blinks all over. Uh, yes. Morty spins around you, mocking the girl's obviousness. Powers above, chief. She's right. I never noticed before. You're covered in scars. <laughs> They're old scars. I'm fine. She nods quietly, lowering her hand. I had some questions. She can't seem to tear uh, to tear her eyes from your scars. Oh, how shameful of me. Don't mind my rude staring. I'm named Nenny. She makes a slight uh, la, la, curtsy, blah, blah, blah. It is my great pleasure to welcome you to our brothel. Hmm. Brother for the slating of intellectual lust, yes. She returns to staring at your body. You have tattoos under those scars, too. What's that one? That one's... Looks fascinating. Look at the way the lines of ink. I think that's ink. She squints at the tattoo, then reaches out to touch it. Allow her to touch it. I think that's ink. She traces a finger around the edge of the tattoo. Is it ink? And what a pattern. Look at the way the lines intersect here. She touches the center of the tattoo. That's simply amazing. She purses her lips and frowns in disappointment. Hmm. I could make it out better if there weren't so many scars. Well, there's nothing to be done about the scars. They're permanent. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Box on me for even mentioning them. She cringes, but I have to know. Are you absolutely sure you're alright? I'm looking at you and I can't help but believe that you're not in some pain. Amnesia. But that's all. If we could remove scars, we could find out what the tattoos are. Good point. Huh. Amnesia, any blanks, then brightens. Loss of memory. You are so lucky. You're so good looking. She's chimes perkily. Every... Everything must be so new to you. Uh, yeah, but it's an uh, unwelcome newness because it's a newness to things I should already know. That sounds so sad. Yeah, so sad. <laughs> uh, is she a teenager? Yes, it is. Or has the IQ of a young teenager. I have some questions, though. What are you doing here? I'm talking to you, silly! Yeah, not the brightest uh, bulb in the box. She giggles and pokes you in the belly, just like I talk to all the patrons here. Yeah, the stupid young girl act. All the prostitutes do, that's what the brothel is about. Learning new ways to talk and share experiences and understand other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What can you tell me about the silent prostitute? She's a mysterious one, isn't she? Do you know that she never speaks? Truly! Nanny leans in and lowers her voice. I think she was emotionally wounded, so badly that she may never speak again. I bet Delora knows, because she sometimes talks to the last lover... Oh, Echo had when she still spoke. Again the same thing. Nothing useful from this idiot, though. Oh, Delora's walking around. There's Vivian. Let's see, there's other people. Juliet! Let me be our Romeo. She's sulking. This dark-haired young woman is staring listlessly off into space, sighing miserably and occasionally picking up at the seams of her clean velvet gown. Wow, she seems great. 
It's difficult to discern whether she's oppressed or simply bored. She gives you only the briefest of glances before staring off into the distance once more. Greetings, yes. I am the despondent named Juliet. How may I? Uh, never thou mind. Leave me be, please. So annoying. What's wrong? Oh, nothing at all. I only have a terrible personality and uh, outlook in life. Only that I spend my days gazing into the face of mediocrity, my own, seeing if anything can erase its dreadful, tedious passage. I am so blasé. Is your life so tedious? Alas, it is. Tedious as this writing and shallow character definition. She sighs, closing her eyes and massaging her temples. Dreadfully boring writing. The writing is not there. Perhaps I could make it less boring you f for you, my lady. <laughs> That's very subtle. No, no, tis kind of thee to offer, though. I am already with a man, sir, and I do love him dearly. But oh so tediously and boringly. Tis that I wish something more of our liaison. There's a problem, then. Yes, in that there are no problems to speak of. Our families took the news of our courtship splendidly. His siblings love my siblings. And our friends think our union to be blessed by the powers themselves. Oh, so tedious. Oh, so blasé. And all fine and good, but things are going so smoothly. Tis not right to have such a trouble-free courtship. Yes, what a tragedy this is. I don't know about that. Dost thou not? Hast thou ever had such a courtship? She glances briefly at you. Twould seem that thy life is filled with a variety of problems judging by the pallor of thy skin. Well, I can't remember any of my courtships. Remnants of the ones I have encountered suggest that I may have some problems with uh, them. It is just that all my friends have such interesting relationships. Yes, what a, <laughs> what a victim of society. Ones fraught with turmoil, shooting families, daggers at one's backs, poison mad siblings, and irate fathers with large swords. I have a lover with whose family loves me and who the word loves. <laughs> I hate you with a passion. A great source of annoyance. <laughs> yes. How I wish I could formulate some way to spice things up. I feel sorry for her lover. <laughs> Just more to... Yep. <laughs> he doesn't know how bad he has it. A chit like this is nothing but trouble. What did you have in mind, Juliet? I'm not sure. Some element of danger. Jealousy. Something intense. Well, why don't you make up some love letters? Excellent notion! Most excellent. She suddenly frowns, but he knows my handwriting. Will Stout write some from me? Hmm. I can find you some, perhaps. Oh, wouldst thou? Excellent. When thou dost find some, please give them to my love, Montague. Ah, definitely uh, supposed to be uh, some sort of allegory to uh, Romeo and Juliet. He may be found within the Civic Fest Hall. As for the letters, please, please try Scofflop Pen. He runs a print shop in the Lower Lord. Ah, good. We uh, know where that is. Yes, definitely uh, a hint at Juliet, Romeo, Montague. Updated my we'll journal. find you some uh, letters and uh, tragedy, because your life is oh so untragic. Ha. Uh, too untragic. Finim's book. As you make to search the armor, its handles suddenly yank out of your grasp. Hello. Hello indeed. What have we here, a rogue after some ladies' frilly undergarments? Who are you? I am Luis, 
And who are you? Thoughtless, uncut fellow, rummaging about in other people's things. Never mind that, what are you doing here? Well, sir, if you must know, I am being an armoire. Why are you being an armoire? I happen to have become an armoire because I want to be an armoire. Thank you very much. It's not to watch the ladies undressing, nor to have them place their soft, sweet-smelling undergarments in my drawers where they can rub against my skin. <laughs> yeah, I'm g not that at all. Such accusations are an insult to a practitioner of the magic arts. I am merely soaking in the experience of what it means to be an armoire. The sights, the smells, the sensations. So all the women know about this then? Yes, yes, they do. And they wholeheartedly approve of. Well, not with their entire hearts exactly, but they not have spoken of their approval in my presence, since they are not exactly aware that I am an armoire. And I would not want them to know that I am anything but, and so have not been able to inquire upon the matter. Yeah. I'll need something from you to keep this quiet. Very well, Posh. Open the third drawer, your scallywag. As you reach your hand into the drawer, it slams shut on your fingers with great force. Searing pain races through your hand as you withdraw your battered fingers. Damn you! Ha <laughs> ha! Kratin, idiot, opens the drawer, I said, and you reach in. <laughs> I'm going to chop you up from kindling. I'm going to tell them right now. First, I will tell you this one thing. I have been popping in and out of the brussel for a good long time, and I'm quite knowledgeable regarding both its occupants and their activities. I assure you that talking about me is utterly worthless. Not only you'll lose me as a potential source of information, but I'll simply disappear before someone comes to investigate your claims, leaving you looking the fool. <laughs> right, so I have some questions. What do you know about the silent prostitute? Always been mute. Blah, blah, blah. Other questions. Can you return to your form at will? The armor seems to think about this for a moment. I have no need to share such secrets with the likes of you, and there is no cause to change back at the present moment. Since I have not blah 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 blah. Right. Well, what's in the book? Research journal of a linguist named Finnum. Well, we've uh, seen Finnum. And we only have Delora left to talk to. Oh, Vivian. I have not talked to Vivian either, or the Modrons. This is a very interesting... Very interesting uh, establishment, though. Lots to discover yet. But all of that is going to be next time. Until then! <laughs>